This program is produced and distributed by Keep the Faith. Welcome to the Keep the Faith Home Study College course. His Holiness Pope John Paul II expressed the desire that every home be made a center of study for the faith. Through this college home study course, we hope to comply with the Holy Father's request. In looking at some of the fundamentals of Catholic moral theology, that's where we looked first. We looked at certain fundamental presuppositions and principles that uh, apply to everything, and that underlie everything. And after that preliminary or fundamental consideration, we moved into some specific topics some of them having to do with the medical realm and some having to do with the life and death ethic. What I'd like to do in this session is to concentrate on the notion of human sexuality in the context of virtue. Uh, very important that we place it in the context of virtue perhaps the public unmentionable, the virtue of chastity. Basically, chastity is a Christian virtue, and therefore it is for all Christians. It is not a synonym for celibacy and should not be confused with it. But if chastity is a Christian virtue, then it's for all Christians. And so, uh, premarital chastity, marital chastity, post-marital chastity, uh, non-marital chastity. Since it is a Christian virtue, it applies to all. And what is chastity except that power, that virtue, that ability that moderates the desire for sexual pleasure according to certain principles? Uh, principles of faith and of reason according to one's state in life in marriage in accord with that state in life. Uh, Pre-marriage, those who wish to marry, and non-marriage or celibacy, um, chastity or purity is actually opposed to what is lustful. Maybe it would help if we followed, at least initially, some consideration which we take from C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Mere Christianity way back in the 1940s, which has been printed and reprinted 18, 20, 23 times. And in the middle of that book, Mere Christianity, there's a section called Christian Behavior, and it has 12 little components. I believe originally they were radio talks, very short, very good. And each one is about a particular Christian virtue. And in that, and in his discussion of chastity, C.S. Lewis makes a comparison, but he makes a distinction. He distinguishes chastity from modesty or decency or propriety. Those things are different. Modesty, propriety, decency, these have to do with how much of the body is displayed, what is discussed, and what kind of terms do we use in that kind of discussion. And these vary somewhat depending on time and place, depending on our social circumstances. What is modest and decent in one part of the world may not be considered modern or decent in another part of the world. So in, in those instances, that is modesty, decency, and propriety, C.S. Lewis suggested that we look behind such things so that we can see if we can come for the purpose or the motive behind it, particularly if it's a question of breaking the rules of propriety. If someone were to break the rules of propriety to excite lust in themselves or in someone else, that really would be against chastity. If they, however, broke such rules out of uh, ignorance or out of carelessness, that would really be against bad manners. 
if they broke such rules really to shock or to embarrass someone else, that would really be against charity. To make other people uncomfortable, I believe, as Lewis wrote, is uncharitable. So, sometimes people who are concerned with a particularly strict or fussy standard of propriety, that may or may not be uh, any proof of chastity or an aid to it, but we do live in this in, with this current inconvenience. Different people of different ages no longer really acknowledge the same standards. So, while some of this present confusion reigns, maybe suggest as Lewis did some 30, 40 years ago, some of the older people should not suggest that all the youngsters are corrupt and some of the youngsters should not assume that all older people are hopeless prudes and puritans. It might help a great deal if we desire to believe all the good we can about someone else and make others as comfortable as we can. That might help reduce some of the present inconvenience. But remember those inconveniences and those distinctions have to do with modesty and decency and propriety which can vary in some degree depending on social circumstances. However, that is not the case with chastity. Chastity as a Christian virtue applies to all Christians and applies in the same way to all Christians. Our present Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, issued an apostolic exhortation on the role of the Christian family in the modern world. I believe this is really an important publication. Uh, it was released on November the 22nd back in 1981. Very full, very extensive. In fact, it's a subject on which the present Holy Father is an expert in his own right. Many times he has said in papal talks and discussions, particularly with other priests, to make the notion of stable marriage and family life the prime consideration of their priesthood and their preaching. And he says he has always done that since he was first ordained. And he has certainly not failed us in that regard. Shortly after becoming Pope, beginning in September of 1979, right up until the Wednesday afternoon when the Holy Father was shot in St. Peter's Square, he had a whole series of talks about human sexuality, and marriage, the holiness of marriage, the inviolability of human life. He fulfilled that promise that he made. Secondly, in every country that he visits for over three days, he will set one, one day aside to talk to parents and to youngsters, same theme, the holiness of marriage, the value of the family, inviolability of uh, innocent human life. So too on this apostolic exhortation, which came out of the Synod of Bishops of 1980. This was the first synod over which Pope John Paul II presided. Certain public relations types suggested that he do something non-controversial in the first synod that was under his direction. And in talking to the College of Cardinals on the 22nd of December, of 1980, he outlined that the holiness of marriage, the value of the family, the inviolability of human life are so important and so much the primary duty of his apostolate and pontificate that he says the, they cannot be deferred and it cannot be delayed. So contrary to some advice that he not take up supposedly controversial things, uh, he took it up and he took it up very fully. And after that period of a month in 1980, he took the 42 suggestions of all the bishops, the representation of bishops um, at the Synod. And then after a, a long period of study and reflection, he put out this apostolic constitution on um, the role of the Christian family <coughs> in the modern world. And it really is, for all practical purposes, a course I wouldn't say it's a textbook, but it's a, it's a whole integral view of life, stable marriage and family life, in which the Holy Father outlines both what the family is, namely its identity, 
and what is it for? And in breaking that down, he outlines four tasks that I'd like to outline here because I believe it is within that context that what the Catholic Church teaches on chastity, that that's its proper, that's really its proper context. Christian teaching can be stated very simply. Sex is for marriage, marriage is for Christ. That's not a novel invention, it's just something that our contemporaries and many contemporary Christians have simply forgotten. We can, if we abide by the rule with which I started, locate principles, locate principles found in sacred scripture, which have been clarified in sacred tradition, which have been taught in any given age by the teaching church. In this area of stable marriage, family life, and the virtue of chastity, that's what I will try to do. And I don't have to try too hard because the Holy Father has really done it for us of locating certain principles in this area that are founded in Holy Scripture, that have been clarified by sacred tradition, and have been presented in any given age by the teaching church, and they have been presented in our age by the teaching church, in this case, by the Pope himself. The Holy Father outlines what he calls the four general tasks of the family, and the first is what he calls the forming a community of persons, which is really the first obligation of spouses to form a community of persons. Secondly, he speaks of serving life. Serving life in this document breaks down into at least two sections. One is on the transmission of life, which apparently is where the controversy is, and also on the education or rearing. And there's no shortage of controversy on education either. Thirdly, participate in the development of society, that the family unit, he repeats what all Christian teachers have repeated, the family is the basic building block, the basic cell of even civil society. It is antecedent to civil society. The government, the law, the courts, they don't create family or confer rights on them. Families already have rights which should be recognized by the state, not invented, much less obliterated by the state. But there is a proper, proper part of its role and in function is to participate in the development of society because it is on family life that society is really truly built. You can look at history, even secular history. Any society that begins to play fast and loose with stable marriage and family life is a society preparing or exercising the fine art of extinction. Uh, societies don't survive when they start going fast and loose against stable marriage and family life. And fourthly, the life and the mission of the church, or to use the terminology of the Second Vatican Council, which he does employ, the domestic church. That, <coughs> pardon me, just as marriage and family is the basic cell of society, so one of the basic building blocks of the church is, uh, is the notion of the domestic church, or the place of uh, stable marriage and family life uh, therein as well. And within that plan, and that's the overall plan, forming a community of persons, serving life, uh, contributing to the development of society, uh, having an apostolic mission, really an apostolic mission, uh, not something that's grudgingly given away by committees, but something that's kind of constitutive to uh, being a part of, of the church and her own mission, that these are four functions and purposes uh, which families can accomplish um, in the present situation, in the modern situation, and this is the Christian family. We should never, we should never uh, belittle or apologize for this as a proper vocation. Obviously, it is the vocation of the vast number, the vast majority, the superflu, the gigantic majority of most, most Christian Catholics uh, throughout the whole world. And it's in that state of life, of stable marriage and family life, 
that most will either achieve or fail to achieve their salvation. So we're talking about something important. And the Holy Father goes back, actually, to uh, draw most of the basis of his teaching from what he actually describes as the plan of God. He insists that the future of the church, the future of society, basically passes through the family. And that's a very important consideration uh, because, of course, it is true. Now, within that here, we focus basically on just one particular aspect, uh, but we'll come back subsequently to a number of aspects uh, because it is, uh, it is kind of crucial. It's in this notion of first forming a community of persons, serving life both by transmission of life and by the education of life, that in this document, in number 31 of it, the Holy Father, when trying to give reasons, he says, and give a reasoned position for the Christian teaching, the Catholic teaching, that we should look for what he calls biblical foundations, ethical grounds, and personless reasons. This is the task that he entrusts especially Biblical to foundations, uh, ethical grounds, and personless reasons. This rationale uh, of the Holy Father and the invitation to theologians and anyone to work in the area corresponds very much with the principle that we have taken in the first place for looking for um, principles located in scripture that have been clarified by tradition. But in a more modern formulation, of course, uh, we want to look for some personalist reasons uh, as well. How apply this particularly to Christian marriage and especially perhaps to the understanding of human sexuality within Christian marriage? Well, the apostolic exhortation itself, familiaris consortio, uh, directs our attention in, um, in this particular way. If we were to sum it up in two words, both words begin with L and they end with E, one being love, one being life. What the Holy Father is teaching, and certainly not for the first time, because this is what Pope Paul VI taught himself, is that there are two basic constitutive meanings or purposes of human sexuality that are so fundamental and so deep and so profound that if they were to be removed or eliminated, uh, we would have really nothing. And that these are of God's design. So just as in the beginning of his document, the Holy Father speaks of the role of the family by God's design. Almost the hallmark of this present pope. In fact, his signature very often is, let's go back to the beginning. And the beginning, of course, turns out to, begin to be the beginning of everyone's first book of the Bible, which is the book of Genesis. How was it in the beginning? And, and we go back. So too with here. Not that we're looking, as some might caricature it, say, for a proof text or something, but for this understanding of the dimension of love and life in human sexuality within the covenant of marriage, where do we find its biblical foundations and its ethical grounds and its personalist reasons? Well, in this instance, we take them, we take them one by one. In technical terms, the dimension of human love is sometimes called, in theological terms, the unitive dimension. And the dimension of human life is sometimes called the procreative dimension. So whether we say unitive procreative, or in this instance, love and life, we're talking about the same thing. Uh, can we find some biblical foundations for this understanding? Well, indeed we can. If we were to go back to the book of Genesis, Genesis 2:24. We will find there the statement which will turn out to be God's own reason for creating human sexuality in the first place. For this reason a man leaves his mother and father and cleaves to his wife and the two become one flesh. That two in one flesh that we find in Genesis 2.24, that two in one flesh is the only covenant sanctioned by God 
in all of Holy Scripture, and that is the covenant of marriage. And since we're going back to the beginning and we're looking for divine purposes, we're not talking about some mere fallout from blind evolution or chance. We are talking in this instance about what is of God's own design. Do we find anything in the New Testament? In fact, we find in the New Testament uh, an echo, and the reason, actually, the same reason is stated, although this we go at just a little bit backwards. If we were to look in the 10th chapter of St. Mark, there, in Mark 10, verses 5 to 8, is one of the four times that Jesus explains his teaching on divorce and remarriage. But if you remember the passage, this one takes place in a little bit of a controversy. In fact, to tell you the truth, it's, it's a trap. Some rabbis approach Jesus and they ask him, Rabbi, teacher, is it legitimate for a man to divorce his wife for any reason whatsoever? Is it legitimate for a man to divorce his wife? Now, we need a little background on this because in our Lord's time, in the intertestamentary time, um, in the Jewish community especially, because of what was called the Mosaic Bill of Divorce, which is found there in chapter 24 of Deuteronomy, the rabbis at the time of our Lord were really split. They all accepted, they accepted the notion of divorce. The argument among them was basically, should this be for a strict reason or for any reason whatsoever? The strict ones were called the house of the school of Shammai. The loose ones were called the school of Shillel, Shammai and Hillel. Shammai was strict, Hillel was loose. What do you mean strict? Well, it would have to have something to do with unchastity or adultery. That, according to the strict interpretation, was a reason for divorce. Hillel, Hillel was loose. Uh, poorly prepared food was a ground for divorce. Um, a woman wearing her hair uncovered in public was a ground for the divorce. Uh, we see there was a substantial difference. Now, Moses, everybody takes for granted, Moses is the teacher. Moses is the law. Any teacher, any rabbi who comes on against the authority of Moses is, you're just unemployed, you're out of work. Notice the question then, rabbi addressed to Jesus. Rabbi, teacher, is it legitimate for a man to divorce his wife? So now here's a question that's posed basically to trap him. Basically, is he going to side with the school of Shammai, supposedly strict, or the school of Hillel, supposedly loose. Now, those of you who may have uh, grown up in the Bronx or are familiar with uh, rabbinic argumentation will know, if you've ever listened to rabbis carefully, the way you answer a question is by asking a question. That's what they call rabbinic argumentation. And so it appears in Mark 10. Question, Rabbi, is it legitimate for a man to divorce his wife? Answer, Jesus speaking, how was it in the beginning? Notice he answers the question by asking a question. And he continues, how was it in the beginning? In the beginning, God made them male and female. And for this reason, a man leaves his mother and father and cleaves to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Obviously, who is Jesus citing? He is citing the book of Genesis. He is citing the authority of Moses. And then he continues, let no man separate what God has joined together. So he avoids the trap. The trap was, was he going to be liberal or conservative? And in fact, he's much more radical. He disallows the whole notion of divorce and goes back to cite the authority of Moses in the first place, but more significantly, the reason of God himself in creating human sexuality by saying it is for this reason a man leaves his mother and father and cleaves to his wife and the two become one flesh. That two in one flesh is the only covenant mentioned and sanctioned and expressed in Holy Scripture so that the complete expression of human sexuality is only sanctioned in the covenant of marriage, whether that's Old Testament or New. And that's the only time that I can think of where the Lord himself, Jesus himself, gives an explanation behind one of the reasons of the commandments, in this case, the sixth commandment. So, <coughs> we do, the Holy Father is asking that we look for some biblical foundations for the teaching and this dimension of human sexuality that we call human love or the unitive dimension. 
is very well attested, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, and in fact it is cited and taught by Jesus Christ himself. What about the other dimension? The procreative dimension or the dimension of human life? Well, in the Old Testament we can find that as well in Genesis 1.28. In Genesis 1.28 the injunction is placed down there to be fruitful and multiply, the understanding being that Fertility is a human good, it is a God-created good, it is not a disease. It is a good, it is the normal state, it is to be encouraged. And after the flood, in Genesis 9-1 and in Genesis 9-7, it is the only commandment that is repeated. And so it turns up again in the story of creation. Not only the unitive dimension, the two in one flesh, but this covenant of love and life mentioned in the beginning, therefore by divine design, by God's own purpose, um, the teaching of Genesis is there. But we could also extend that a bit, I believe, if you will, with a little bit of extrapolation to the first chapter of St. John's Gospel. What are we doing here? The first chapter of St. John's Gospel is largely familiar to older Catholics because we used to call it the last gospel. And the last gospel was read at the end of almost all, at the end of all low masses. Uh, some of it, I'm sure, is already familiar. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then four down, verses down, and apart from Him, nothing came to be. Apart from Him, nothing came to be. Now some will maintain that you have here the Christian story of creation. What do we mean? Apart from him, nothing came to be. We mean that quite literally. Not you nor I. Not a little kid or an old man. Not a bee, a butterfly, or a panda in southwest China. No blessed thing that exists on this earth. Nothing came to be apart from Almighty God. What do we draw from that? Well, we draw something, basically, about the life of God. If we were to go back, and we must go back, because we're talking there, basically, about the Christian story of creation. Once upon a time, there was a time when no one existed but God. Nothing. Nothing existed. And we know God always existed. God is eternal. At some point in time, God decided to create the world. We call that point in time creation. God decided. He didn't have to create anything, but he did. Therefore, we ask the question, why did God create anything? And the best answer we can come up with is God created out of love. God's own generous decision was not to be self-contained, not to be self-enclosed. Every blessed thing that exists, you, me, the most recent, the most ancient, every blessed thing that exists ultimately came out of this loving, creative act of God where God willed not to be self-contained. That's basically an insight. It's an insight, really, into the very life of God. Uh, we can see the same thing in the Trinity. The nature of the Father is to give everything to the Son. If you were to ask what was the most important thing to Jesus Christ, the most important thing to Jesus Christ was his Father. His first words as a youngster, did you know I had to be about my Father's business? His last words from the cross, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Over a hundred times in the New Testament he says, didn't you know I have to be about my, to do the will of him who sent me, my Father. After the resurrection he says, I must ascend to your Father and to my Father. At death he will say, come, enter the joy my Father has prepared for you. When the disciples didn't know how to pray, Jesus said, this is how you begin. You begin by saying, our Father. So the Father gives everything to the Son. The Son's whole life is one of self-sacrificing, giving to the Father, and the relationship between them is so profound that it's not just a relationship, it is another person. It is the Holy Spirit. It's true in its theological sense, then, to say God is love, provided we are talking about the inner life of the Trinity. Nothing had to exist at all, but for his own creative purpose, God decided not to be self-enclosed, not to be self-contained. In that sense, we say of Christians, particularly Christians who enter a covenant of love and life, 
in a reference sense, they are chips off the old block. That their covenant of love and life. And that's why in Catholic terminology, we use the word procreation, not reproduction. Reproduction is a manufacturing term. But in a covenant of life and love between a husband and a wife who say yes to each other and yes to God, there is an image. There is an echo. There is a Xerox of the original creative love of God in the first place. And so we say all real love has something to do with real life, and all real life has something to do with real love. These are together again because God put them together. And that's one of the words we use um, very often in marriage books and explanations of chari uh, chastity. We use the word procreation because parents really are procreators with God and they replicate in our time and age what God did in the beginning. We know for sure all life came out of God's love. So in the Christian dispensation, actually the Judeo-Christian dispensation, human life, all human life should be transmitted within that same covenant of life and love. So the Holy Father asks us to go back and look for some biblical foundations for this teaching, that, this, that these two dimensions, we're not saying they're the only dimensions, but these two dimensions are so important that they actually constitute the very meaning of human sexuality in a Christian context. And that was explained very carefully in Humani Vitae number 12 and in this document, Familiaris Consortio number 32, repeating Humani Vitae. And we'll spell it out just a little bit further. Uh, because it's very, very important. Sometimes, sometimes people wonder and they say, well, maybe this is the teaching of the church, but where did it come from? Did it come from some monks who were locked up in a monastery in the Sinai Desert? Or did it come from some grouchy celibates who, uh, who are disappointed in love and in life? Uh, did it fall like rain from the clouds? No, no. The reason the church teaches what she teaches is because we, honest to God, believe it is the teaching of Jesus Christ and it is true. If it's not true, none of us should teach it and I wouldn't bother you with it and I hope you wouldn't bother me. But if it is true and it is the teaching of Jesus Christ and it is, in fact, based on principles located in Holy Scripture, clarified by sacred tradition and taught in any given age, including ours, as it is taught in this age by the present Holy Father and all his predecessors, then it's the truth of this that we have to try to discern better, maybe put in our own terminology, but understand better this, what Paul VI called the inseparable meanings willed by God, what he calls the procreative dimension, what I've called life, and the unitive dimension of human sexuality, what he calls love, and that man should not and never arbitrarily separate these two goods. In fact, in Humani Vitae number 8, the Holy Father, in that case Paul VI, spells out that this connection will, these two inseparable meanings, these two essential purposes of human sexuality, that by God's design are together, he said they should be human and total and faithful and creative. What does he mean human? It really should be true human love in the sense that it is the human senses and the spirit. Because it's not just the transport of instinct or mere sentiment. It is meant to last. It is meant to grow. It's not just some kind of emotional reaction, but it should engage the whole person. Not just parts of him or parts of her, but the whole person. Emotion and sentiment, these are components, but we're talking about something that involves more than just that. So really human love with these two dimensions of love and life. The Holy Father next describes as what he calls total. Total in the sense that what we're talking about here is a full partnership without undue reservation or selfish calculation. We are not talking about roommates. There's kind of a roommate syndrome in our society which almost denies human sexuality. They kind of deny that there's a, a male contribution to a marriage and a distinctively female contribution to marriage. They're kind of into androgyny, although it doesn't stop at that. 
The problem, of course, with the roommate syndrome is at least those who have gone to college, you see every year you can have another roommate. And we're not talking about that when we're talking about Christian marriage. We're not talking about people who just happen together because their name alphabetically or their address geographically came through a computer at a certain point in time. No. We are talking basically about a full partnership, not just for the love that one receives, but for the full, the full self and basically how one can enrich the other in this relationship of two in one flesh. And yet, one does not lose his or her personal identity in this giving or in this gift, even though it's total. Each remains distinct. A Christian father remains distinctively a male and makes a male contribution to that marriage. A Christian mother or Christian woman makes a distinctively female contribution to this Christian marriage. They don't dissolve. While remaining distinct, they nevertheless affirm and reaffirm each other, and it's a special kind of friendship, reaching all the way back even if we went to the pagans, say back to Aristotle. Aristotle pointed out that there were certain friendships that changed. Some friendships are, are based on what he called uh, utility. Um, and many people have friendships of utility. It's really what you can get from someone or get out of them. And then if you don't get what you want, you drop that one. That's one type of friendship. He also talked about a type of friendship that's merely based on personal pleasure. Sometimes that doesn't work out all that well either, because if it becomes localized or perhaps boring, uh, that can turn to a different form of repudiation. But even Aristotle, the pagan, pointed out that there's a certain type of total friendship where somebody confides in another all their joys and hopes, all their promises, the truth-telling and the sharing, and you can only do that with one person. We don't even have the time, much less the Constitution, to do that with everyone. And that unique type of friendship is really based on what St. Thomas Aquinas called benevolence. Bene volencia, wishing that other person well. And that's what's true here, even though it is a distinctive contribution without obliteration either part, Always in the two-in-one flesh, that primary act of charity is, I really wish this person well. Human, total, faithful. Faithful, the Holy Father describes as exclusive unto death. Really faithful and exclusive in this life unto death. That means that certain current, current atrocities like uh, renting out parts to surrogates or something, this is just antithetical to the Christian understanding of the two-in-one flesh mentioned in Holy Scripture. Fidelity, lifelong fidelity, sometimes difficult, but always possible, always noble. Nobody can deny, always noble. The traditional marks of the marital covenant are permanence and fidelity. And these goods are important. They're also important to individual husbands and wives themselves. Lots of people have fears. They got money fears, they got health fears, they got in-law fears, they got loss of job fears. No fear can compare to the loss of trust where fidelity is concerned. If you really cannot trust your partner, all many things become impossible. So a love that is human, that is total, that is faithful and exclusive, and fourthly, it is fruitful or creative. What does that mean? It means what it says. It means it's not exhausted merely by the communion between a husband and a wife, but it's really destined to continue, to even raise up new life, living proof of their own love for God and for each other. It also means they are not afraid of the future. This, of course, is the most distinctive and, in fact, unique quality of marriage. Why? Uh, other, other kinds of love kind of terminate in their object. If you see what I mean, I mean, if someone really wants and loves to have a Buick, once you get a Buick, that's about it once you got your Buick. Now, if you really start wanting 11 Buicks, you've probably got some kind of other problem, maybe. But then again, you could be a Buick dealer. But whenever we're talking about mere objects where, well, we possess the object, we're satisfied, that's it. But what we're talking about here, basically this communion of love and life is such that basically these goods are 
uh, distinctive in the sense that they do not really just terminate in the object, but they look out for the good of this best friend. And conjugal love includes, but it transcends that because it's destined to share this love and life with a new human being. Because that love can bring a new life into existence according to God's plan. You can't bring a Buick into existence simply by loving so. You can't even bring a friend into existence by loving so. But the love and life covenant of a husband and wife who say yes to God and yes to each other, their love doesn't stop at each other. But it says yes to the future and actually can bring new life into the world. Just like the Blessed Virgin, who always remained a virgin. But it was when she said yes to God that God actually came into this world. New life. So hers was a yes to life as well. And faithful and exclusive human and total. There are many comparisons. So, relying very much on the teaching of Pope Paul VI and repeating it. But here again in Familiaris Consortio number 32, the Holy Father is describing what Paul VI called this inseparable connection between these two meanings, the procreative and unitive meaning of human sexuality or the love and life meaning of human sexuality, that these are by God's design together and that man should not separate them. Otherwise, we violate the injunction, man should not separate what God has joined together. But I think we could take this a little bit further, and if I'm not mistaken, and I could be mistaken, but in this case, I don't think I'm mistaken. <clears throat> if, if we look at this, I believe basically this is the core of Catholic teaching on sexual morality, no matter what the question is. Any question on the whole line of sexual ethics, one way or another, either violates, destroys, chemically suppresses, or surgically removes one of these dimensions. What do I mean? We know from reading the papers that we read all sorts of really um, unbelievable uh, technological advances with um, uh, AID, uh, artificial insemination, donor, uh, cloning, uh, in vitro fertilization, uh, which we'll call IVF. Uh, they even have uh, surrogate uh, parents and surrogate motherhood. Uh, even if you don't read these things, sooner or later, usually sooner, they all end up on the Phil Donahue show. Because that poor man apparently is obsessed with uh, uh, peculiar variations of normal sexuality, but that's a different problem, kind of voyeurism. Uh, we also have sperm banks. Uh, there's even a, uh, an H.J. Mueller Memorial sperm bank for high IQs somewhere in Southern California. Any kind of R sexual reproduction. What's wrong with this type of thing? Any one of them, or all of them together. And sometimes people come along and they say, gee, I thought your Catholic Church was hit in the head with procreation, so anything goes. The Catholic Church doesn't teach that. The Catholic Church insists never does the covenant of marriage go by the boards or the disruption of God's design simply to achieve some purpose, even a good purpose. And way back in 1951, in a famous address to the midwives, which he repeated in May of 1956, Pope Pius XII uh, outlined what he called the personalist or the unitive dimension of human sexuality and explained that since we hold and we hold seriously that both of these inseparable dimensions really are inseparable, then we can't separate them, even for what would seem apparently a procreative reason. Because if it is apart from natural sexual intercourse or outside of the natural covenant of marriage, that is, outside the covenant of love and life, yeah, you can make a case that AID, cloning, IVF, surrogate is kind of has a life dimension, but it is apart from and at the expense of the personal, faithful, exclusive, unitive love dimension of human sexuality. And that's why those procedures cannot be performed in a Catholic institution. Take the other side. Uh, some will go to extreme forms. Some will take something like uh, homosexuality. And they'll say, oh well, uh, they'll say it, I don't think they can prove it, but they'll say it, 
At least it has the um, element of fostering the unitive dimension. Strictly speaking, by Jesus' definition, it does say uh, a man leaves his mother and father and cleaves to his wife. So it really doesn't foster that. But for the sake of this discussion, we might say so. But obviously, by definition, homosexuality cannot ever have anything to do with procreation. That's impossible. So to here, with artificial birth control, or permanent birth control, which is sterilization. Uh, most of the justifying reasons presented are normally, well, we're trying to foster the love dimension, but is at the expense of separating, chemically suppressing, or surgically removing the procreative dimension of human sexuality. And just to make kind of a complete spectrum, uh, the question of uh, masturbation obviously doesn't honor either dimension. It is neither a love dimension, nor is it a life-giving dimension, which is really part of the present danger. You see so much of the terminology, whether it comes out of Saul, Gordon, or uh, some form of uh, Planned Parenthood's publication, uh, they're always talking about self-pleasuring, as they call it. That's the problem. It is pleasurable, but it's only the self, and there's no other partner. There is no love dimension. There is no uh, life dimension, and it's got nothing to do with that two in one flesh. That's why I think we can say that when we look for the reasons, in this case the deep reason, what is really behind the sexual ethic of received Christian teaching? And I would like to underline that. Prior to 1930, no Christian church anywhere in the world taught otherwise on any of these. Since 1930, some Christians have adopted first uh, birth control in some cases, then it was sterilization in some cases, and then of course it was abortion in some cases. That unholy triangle uh, inevitably one leads to the other, but that's a different discussion. But what we're saying then is that these two dimensions, which are of God's design, where we do find uh, biblical foundations, and I think ethical grounds, the Holy Father said, biblical foundations, ethical grounds, personalist reasons. And the ethical ground, if we look for the, for the reason and the rationale of what's behind the church's, well, really what's behind authentic, true Christian teaching on homosexuality, I think that really is the ethical reason. And personless grounds, it is a mistake to describe either procreation or the unit dimension, but especially procreation as some kind of mere biology and not personalist. Uh, you and I are not angels. If we were angels, we'd be pure spirits without bodies. If we were just bodies without spirits, we'd be uh, rugs. We are in a unique thing. We are what they call a body-soul composite. That means that I am as much the soul of my body as I am the body of my soul. That means that a human good, like fertility, really is a human good. It's really part of being a real human. Now, the complete exercise of that good is sanctioned only in scripture within the covenant of marriage. But many are talking about it as if it's some kind of impersonalism. Is eyesight impersonal? And anyhow, if it's employed within the covenant of marriage, the argument here is not really that both of these have to be exercised in every instance and in every case and in every way. The church's basic argument is basically that we never act against these goods. There are times, times of periodic infertility, when the natural result will not occur. But there's no positive, chemical, surgical, or artificial action against that. That's no problem. We call that natural family planning, an acceptable form, provided it's surrounded by a good vision and good virtues and values. But we're not saying, what we are saying is, don't act against, don't destroy, don't separate what God has joined together. So that, in the final analysis, uh, John Paul II is saying, this is really of God's design. This is God's design for love and life, supremely so in the covenant of marriage. And we underline again the important place that he sees. He just doesn't see the church going through the family. He sees the world and all of human history going through the family. Therefore, things that disturb or pollute stable marriage and family life, he sees as social threats. But he comes back to this design, as is his registered trademark. Let's go back to the beginning. Jesus taught that way. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's look and see if we can elicit and discern God's creative purposes. And if we can, 
And if this is of God's design, and it is, well then, the Holy Father asks us, let us be cooperators with God's design, not arbitrators of God's design. Let us be ministers of God's design, not manipulators of his design. In effect, let us respect God's word and respect each other. That is so fundamental. It is so fundamental to the virtue of chastity, and it's fundamental to chastity in marriage. Most fundamental thing is respect. Where respect is present, lots of beautiful things can be there. Love can be there, love can grow, and all sorts of other virtues. Lots of virtues are necessary. Consistency, generosity, forgiveness, help. But if respect is not there, it's very difficult to love someone whom you don't respect. Even, even little kids can figure out who respects whom. It gets to be a very tough situation. Well, if that's so, our first and fundamental respect is we respect God's word. Why? Because when a Christian man and a Christian woman say yes to God, they're not just saying yes to God in any old way in general. They're saying yes to God's design for their love and their life together, for the covenant of two in one flesh that God designed for them. When they say yes to God and yes to each other, then that's our final word with the Holy Father. Respect God's word and respect each other and all sorts of other things will find their proper place. And besides that, remember what the church teaches is true. And we learn from St. John, the truth will set you free. Very important to know this. Even if the Holy Father were the only voice saying it, and he's not, others have moved mountains in this country to make sure that we don't hear or that we don't learn about this document, which we should all know about and implement in every parish. But the truth, he speaks and others speak. And the truth will set you free. For instance, if we live this truth, it will free you from disease. It will free you from planned parenthood. It will free you from herpes B or AIDS. It will free people from the indignity of turning their spouse into a chemistry set. It will also free you from sin. And that's the freedom that counts, because that's the freedom, that's the truth that will really make us free. God's true design about love and life for everyone. It's not just for Catholics, it's for everyone. That's God's design for marriage. Respect God's word, respect each other. Many other things will find their proper place.